Well, let's continue then with our series on the return to the land. And we finished last week talking about Nehemiah's decision to live there rather than return to his position of power and authority back in uh, Susan, Susan. One of the first things that Nehemiah did when he first came to uh, Jerusalem was to organize a survey of what he had to do. And in uh, chapter 2, verses 11 to 16, it says, So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and to the refuge gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were burned with fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the wall. Then I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials and the others who did the work. So... <clears throat> Nehemiah viewed his, what he had to do and then set about making a plan for doing it. Now, he was a pretty bold sort of a character. Where am I going? Take another one. Lessons from Israel. No. Go forward one. <clears throat> and he got up and he told the people what he was going to do. And their response was good. They, it was immediate. But then so was the reaction of those who didn't want the walls of Jerusalem built. They were greatly displeased when someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. And in uh, chapter 2, 19 and 20, we can see there the three leaders, I won't go further than that, the three leaders were Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Arab. <clears throat> when they heard what they were going to do, they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? And Nehemiah's answer was, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. In other words, it was a pretty bold answer. What's your hurry? Where's your hat? Get out. They, they've got no place in Jerusalem. They're Ammonites. They're Arabs. They're the people of Canaan who the Israelites were told originally, get rid of them. And they didn't get rid of all of them. That was part of the problem. Well, hang on, where am I? Got myself a little bit lost. I have, I've got myself lost. I'll get there, don't worry. 
Better is prayer, we did that. 7 to 10, we've done that. Right, we've got one missed out. No, we haven't. There it is. Nehemiah the man. Nehemiah was born in exile. In his early life, he was exposed to great temptation because he was in the king's court where there was all sorts of debauchery and other things, but he stayed true to his faith. And he finished up being what we would call the butler to the king. His job was to make sure that no one poisoned the king. So he was a food taster as well. It's a position of influence. It's also a position where you're likely to be the first one to get knocked off the perch if someone does try to poison the king. But essentially, he was a devout man. He was a man of spirit. He was faithful. He was simple-hearted, not simple-minded, simple-hearted, patriotic and godly. He was valued by the pagan monarch as a good and faithful servant. And we might well say of him what Jesus said of Nathaniel in, one jo in John chapter 1, verse 47, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. And that very nicely fits Nehemiah as well. He arrived in Jerusalem about 13 years after Ezra. But Nehemiah, Ezra had been appointed as governor of the Jews. So he was like the minister for Jewish affairs, if you like. Nehemiah was appointed governor of the province. So he not only had the Israelites, he also had anybody else that lived in the area of Israel, including Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arab. His administration lasted some 36 years. And the secret of his efficiency lay in always bringing things before God as a man of humility and purity of motive. And that, of course, reveals the power that can be exerted by someone who has no purpose in life but that which is centred on God. You know, we have unlimited power available to us if our life is centred on God. <clears throat> and of course, the book of Nehemiah continues the, uh, the story of the return, and it's particularly the building of the walls. The temple has been built. Now they want to wall the city again. And of course, cities in the ancient wo world were walled for protection, but also the walls were symbolic. Unwalled cities merited contempt. Walled cities were seen as significant. And Nehemiah couldn't stand the thought that the city of God should not have walls, and he committed himself to build them. So essentially, the outline of the book in chapters 1 to 6, he talks about where the walls are rebuilt. In 7 to 12, there's a renewal of the covenant by the people. And in chapter 13, the sins of the people are purged. <clears throat> Excuse me. The covenant referred to what we would call the Mosaic law or the Sinaitic covenant, the covenant at Mount Sinai, and that was based in the Abrahamic covenant anyway. So the law was sort of viewed as a formal contract that defined the relationship between God and his people. Nehemiah was also a man of prayer. And he prayed before he went. And he prayed in his heart, or he fasted and prayed for three months before he spoke to the king and asked the Lord to turn the king's heart so that he would allow him to return to build the walls. 
but it all panned out exactly as God wanted it to happen. And Nehemiah was sent off with the king's blessing. And as I said, was also appointed the governor. So he had a political appointment as well as a religious position. And it was something of a joke for men like Ezra and Nehemiah to realize that the Israelites needed fresh beginnings. They'd returned to the promised land originally with, well, originally under Zerubbabel, with great expectations as to what was going to happen. They enthusiastically journeyed hundreds of miles. Zerubbabel took five months to get there with some 50,000 people. Ezra was shorter. He only took four months and he also took a shorter route, but he only had about 2,000 with him. <clears throat> and they started to rebuild the temple, but they stopped at the foundation. And then the Lord stirred up the prophets Haggai and Zechariah and they started to prophesy to Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest, and got them stirred up again and stirred up the people. And they started to prophesy in 520 and the temple was finished in 516. And they expected the Messiah to return. They got the temple ready. Now, when's the Lord coming back? Well, the Messiah didn't come. And the old patterns of life, the old materialism, and the old values crept in. There was no excuse. It was wrong. But it did happen to them, just as it happens to you and to me. When a people or an individual does drift from God, it's time for recommitment. It's time for the fresh start that God is always willing to give us when we return to him. He's often referred to as the God of the second chance, but he's the God of the third chance and the fourth chance and the fifth chance. If you are genuine in returning to him, repenting of your falling away, repenting of your sin and asking him for forgiveness. Never forget 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins under the Father, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And if you're cleansed of all unrighteousness, what are you? Righteous in his sight. <clears throat> well, all we can say about Nehemiah, he's a pretty bold sort of a character. I go past that. That tells you something about the man. Rather than go back and live in luxury back in the court, he was prepared to, well, by comparison, rough it out in Jerusalem. Still lived pretty well. We'll tell you more about that later. And There we've got some of his problems and his responses. Remember his enemies are Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arab. They ridiculed him. But his response was he asked God to vindicate himself and the Israelites, and they ignored the ridicule. There was a plot that was formed by these three leaders of the other, the opposition. There was a plot to attack the builders. But Nehemiah found out about it. And he set half the workers to stand guard, fully armed. And he set the other half to work on the walls and they also carried a weapon. And he encouraged Israel, remember the Lord. The Lord is with us. And that's something that's often very easy for us to forget, that the Lord is with us. Never leave you nor forsake you. How many times 
is that said in the scripture by the Lord, by Jesus, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's like the fear not 366 times fear not. There's one there for leap year as well. <clears throat> he also had a problem within the Jewish community. As with any society, some were wealthy, some were not so wealthy, and the poorer ones were borrowing money from the wealthy ones who were charging them interest. Now, you might say, what's wrong with that? Well, the law of the Lord said, thou shalt not charge interest to a fellow Israelite. So Nehemiah got up the ribs of the wealthy ones and got them to remit the interest and to return the lands that were taken as security. They'd learned all about mortgages from the Egyptians. Joseph invented mortgage. And mortgage has got an interesting uh, meaning to it. A gauge is a pledge and mort is death. So you're pledged unto death. <laughs> so remember that when you're paying off your mortgage. <clears throat> Nehemiah also set him an example himself. As the governor, he had the right to demand, uh, what do I call it, income from the people to support the governor and the governor's house and so on. He didn't do that. He supported himself and he paid for about 150 odd servants and captains and all sorts of other things. And anybody that came along, they were welcome in his house. He covered all that himself. So he must have been a fairly wealthy man himself. He never, ever took what the governor had the right to take. Four times. Tobiah in particular, invited Nehemiah to meet him on the plains of Ono to discuss the differences that they had. Nehemiah never went because he knew darn well that they were setting a trap for him. They intended to eliminate the problem. In other words, eliminate Nehemiah. And then they hired Shemaiah the prophet. Now, Shemaiah was a Jew. He was part of the deal, part of the return. But he also didn't have a very high standard of ethics because these other guys hired him to frighten Nehemiah into hiding in the temple. Well, Nehemiah refused to hide from possible examples, and so he set an example of courage. But more than that, he knew the law, and the law says no one but the priests and the high priest enters the temple. To do so, not being a priest or the high priest, meant death, stoning. The Israelites had stoned him. And he wasn't going, going to go in there and defile the temple. So there's more to it than just avoiding possible assassination. And then they sent a letter to Artaxerxes. They threatened him, saying, Nehemiah planned rebellion. You know, this guy, he's going to set himself up as king of the Jews and he's going to rebel against you and so on. Well, Nehemiah's response to that was, you've got a good imagination. And he just kept on with the work. And at times, the job, the sheer immensity of the job, almost crushed the Jews. But you know, they finished the walls in 52 days. And this is when they worked long hours, half standing guard, the other half working and they swapped over. But whoever was working still carried a weapon. They were ready for anything. 52 days, they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. 
And then we see in chapter 5, a short account of Nehemiah's 12-year tenure as governor. He supported himself rather than charged the people with his maintenance. He did not take advantage of his position to acquire land or feather his nest. His time was devoted to making Jerusalem safe for his brother Jews, not on building his personal fortune. He supplied his own table, that means he supplied his own food, and welcomed strangers to share his hospitality. And he did all this because he feared God. If God kept track of his sacrifices, that was sufficient for Nehemiah. <clears throat> Nehemiah was also a man of prayer. In chapter one, you see the prayer that he prayed for God to soften the heart of the king so that the king would accede to his request to return and rebuild the walls. But there's more than that. As with Ezra, Nehemiah identified with the people. And that gives us an insight into his prayer life. And that's in chapter one, verses one to 11. Call it the prayer of confession, if you like. But his other prayers were very often prayers of action. And uh, some commentators call them arrow prayers because they're short, sharp, and direct. Come on, go forward. Why is it not doing that? That's not the last one, Chris, is it? Arrow prayers, there it is. In 2.4, the king says, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And the scripture goes on that I prayed to the God of heaven in my heart. Silent prayer, but short sharp and to the point in 4 9 nevertheless we made our prayer to our god and because of them we set a watch against them by day and night lord what do we do thank you lord in 5 19 remember me my god for good according to all that i have done for these people short sharp to the point and in 6 9, for they all were trying to make us afraid, saying, Their hands will be weakened in the work, and it will not be done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Short, sharp to the point. That's practical prayer. Uh, this next one, Chris. This is practical prayer. It's a person who relies on God and how much we need to learn from Nehemiah's prayer life. Let confession start us on a fresh start then rely fully on God while we keep on with our daily work. Nehemiah met opposition with a determined reliance on God, going to him in prayer and relying on his guidance. Now that's important to us too. We need to know our spiritual and personal goals. And then as problems arise, we need to deal with them in such a way that we keep on making progress toward whatever our goals may be. And how good it is, like Nehemiah, to know that we have been faithful in doing something that pleases the Lord. Well, in chapter eight, we see there where Ezra reads the Lord. Remember Ezra? He's an old man now. Nehemiah is a much younger man. But Ezra reads the law. And they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. And that goes for eight days. And Ezra read the law every day to the people. 
but the Le the priests and the Levites had to interpret it. What do you mean they had to interpret it? Well, very simply, the language of the people who had now been there for some time was Aramaic. The law was written in Hebrew. So they wouldn't have understood a word if he'd read it in Hebrew. But Ezra did read it in Hebrew and the others interpreted it to Aramaic. It's just like some of us who've been overseas preaching to others, you, use, you have an interpreter to interpret what you say. And remember that when you're translating or interpreting, it's not word for word. It can't be because no language interprets word for word with another language. They have to interpret the sense of it. The same happens with our Bible. There's a lot of things in our English which don't translate well from the Greek in the New Testament. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God in him or in Christ. Some translations say that we might become the righteousness of God. That be or become is the present continuous tense in Greek. To translate it into English, it goes like this. That we might become and continue to be. Now that's an awkward phrase in English. So they just use be or become. But the Greek is a present continuous tense. If you have become the righteousness of God in Christ, that is a continuing state. It's a continuing position in Christ. To be or become and continue to be. So even in our English versions, there are phraseologies in there which do not translate the original languages. They translate the sense of the original language. Doesn't mean to say it's not God's word but it's God's word in a way that we can understand it. And so the translation into Aramaic was so that they could understand the sense of God's word. Well, they celebrated tabernacles and he read it from dawn to dusk every day. The result of that was that the people made a sure covenant and they wrote it that they would obey the Lord in all things. And so Nehemiah had not only led the people of Judah to rebuild the walls of the city, he had led them to a renewed commitment to God and to his revealed will. Ah, then we come to Nehemiah chapter 13. 10, 11 and 12 essentially contain a record of the various families, clans, priests, Levites, and leading residents of Jerusalem and the surrounding villages. Another one of those long gene genealogy type things. But you see, there's a break in Nehemiah's governorship. He had returned to Persia to report to the king. We don't know how long he was away. But when he came back, he was stunned by what he's found. The fresh start promises had been broken once again. The people bought and sold on the Sabbath. A guest room for one of Judah's pagan enemies, to, actually it was Tobiah, had been prepared in the temple of God itself. Once again, the Jews were marrying foreign wives. As for their children, half spoke in the language of Ashdod. None was able to speak the language of Judah, but the language of his own people. They've all gone backwards again. So the first thing Nehemiah does when he comes back, this is around about 432 BC, he kicked Tobiah out of the temple. Oh. How could you do that? Why was he in there? 
Well, the high, the, one of the, or the high priest was his son-in-law. Even the high priest had married a woman of a foreign god. So he got the boot too. He's out. And expelling foreigners, they were finishing the job that they started back in Nehemiah 9. Eliashib, the priest, had made a home for the wicked Tobiah in the forecourt of the house of God, using a storeroom which should have been full of tithes for the Levites and the priests. But it wasn't because they weren't tithing anymore either. So there was no provision for the priesthood. Therefore, the priesthood, the Levites and the priests had to go back out on the land and earn their living because they had no support. Well, we know that Nehemiah is a bold man, a courageous man, and it didn't take him long to remedy the situation. And in Nehemiah 13, verse 25, it says, I rebuked them, Nehemiah reported, and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. That's not what happened to me. And pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, you are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. And as for the grandson of the high priest, who was one of those who'd married a foreign woman, I drove him away from me. And even the Levites who served the temple had returned to their land because the people no longer paid their temple tithes. And that's where the book of Nehemiah ends. So, what lessons do we have from the book of Nehemiah? When you're in leadership of any sort, make the welfare of God's people more important than your own. Now, we're not talking about preferential treatment in the, the world of business. We're talking about when you're in leadership of God's people, you always make the welfare of the people more important than your own. Refuse evil alliances. Don't marry an unbeliever. Reject compromise and worldly ways. Make prayer a priority in all situations. I was given a little triangular shaped paperweight, which now sits in front of my computer at home. And it has in large letters, pray first. I think that's why my computer keeps going. Express gratitude for all success and favor. In everything, give thanks. You don't give thanks for the bad things. You give thanks because God's got the answers. He is the answer. Ignore insults from opposition. Trust God's faithfulness and his justice. Champion the cause of the poor and needy and honor people of integrity who fear the Lord. And that brings us to the prophet Malachi. The name Malachi means my messenger, whether it's actually his name or not, or whether it's just a title that he's assumed because of the meaning, my messenger. He is God's messenger. This is 90 odd years have passed between the first return to the land under Zerubbabel and Joshua. And again, the Jews had mingled in marriage with non-Jewish people of the land outside of the covenant people. The term daughter of a foreign God means a woman of a foreign religion. And we know that Malachi prophesied during the Persian control. 
because he uses Persian words for positions of authority, governor and so on. He's using Persian words. Had it been later, as some people think, when it was under the Seleucids, Antiochus IV and all the rest of it, he'd have been using Greek names, not Persian names. So he's still in this block. The priesthood had been corrupted. They were offering defective sacrifices. Moral and religious condition of Israel was at a low ebb. They needed a good kick in the pants and Malachi was just the fellow to give it to them. Instead of the language of promise and encouragement, which were used by Haggai and Zechariah, Malachi is full of reproof and warnings. It's interesting that the last verses of Malachi and of our Old Testament, Malachi 4, 5 and 6, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. But when Jesus started the Sermon on the Mount, he starts it off with blessed are those. He's about to reverse the curse. So for a quick outline of the book of Malachi, we see where it talks of God's unwearied love for his people. Next, he talks about the sins of the priest and polluted sacrifices. Then he gets into the evil of idolatry and divorce. Then he talks about the coming judgment. And then there's a call to repent, repent, robbing God in tithes and offerings. You know, tithes and offerings is actually a great privilege to be able to give back to God something that he has given to you. It's a great privilege and it brings blessing. Then we hear of the book of remembrance. And that's the one where the faithful are recorded and are therefore delivered from God's wrath. And lastly, he talks of the day of the Lord and Elijah to come. Now, there's another interesting one in Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. There are some commentators who think that my messenger is Jesus. Well, I don't agree with that. I think the my messenger is talking about as Malachi calls it, the Elijah to come. He is the messenger who will prepare the way before me, meaning God. So he's going to prepare the way before the Lord. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, that's Jesus, or the Messiah, in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming. And of course, we see that, well, in John 2, 13 to 16, and also in Matthew 21, 12 to 13, where Jesus cleansed the temple. He did it twice, actually. Jesus cleansed the temple. The Lord came to his temple. And they didn't recognize it. He drove commercialism out of his temple environs. See, profiteering for an ex excessive fee had again sprung up in the outer courts. Sacrificial animals and birds were being bought and sold at exorbitant rates. Money changers were changing money to the half-shekel temple tax. 
for exorbitant exchange fees. You want a half shekel? That's going to cost you so many drachma or whatever it might be. It wasn't even exchange. They were profiteering. Sort of like petrol prices. And now, as Jesus' ministry drew to a close, again, he drove out those who were profiteering from sacred activities. Now, the angel, when he was speaking to Zechariah concerning the birth of John the Baptist, in Luke 1.17, he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And in Jesus, talking of John the Baptist in Matthew 11, quotes again, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. And he tells them, John the Baptist was Elijah. And finishes up by saying, who, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And what Jesus is saying is that John fulfilled the ministry of Elijah of Malachi. Therefore, Jesus was the Messiah. He who has ears, let him hear. You see, the post-exilic prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, form a bridge between the Old and the New Testament. The Hebrew Old Testament is set out differently. The last book of the uh, Hebrew Old Testament is actually two chronicles. And the prophets come before the writings, as they call them. But that's another aside. So what have we learnt in this saga of four Sundays trying to give an overview of the return to the land? Well, firstly, we see that God never honours evil conduct. We should seek his will in all things and then obey him in all things. Trust him to recover seemingly hopeless situations <clears throat> and pray first, not as a last resort. <clears throat> How many times have we probably said to ourselves, well, we've done everything, can I suppose we better pray. No, no, pray first. The next one, commit to true worship and not mere formalism even the most evangelical of churches can drop into formalism it's nice to have order in a service but when that order becomes so rigid that it becomes the only way in which the church can worship god hey that's wrong you're losing the moving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit directs the church. The Holy Spirit directs worship. The Holy Spirit should be allowed to move in whatever way he wants to. That's one of the things that I do like about your open worship. It's an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to move and for men of God to be moved by the Holy Spirit. And I'm sure you've all felt it at different times where there's just a, a flow and you can actually feel the presence of God when the Spirit is allowed to move and not bound by formalism. Practice tithing. It's a covenant of privilege to exercise in faithful joy. Read 2 Corinthians 9, 7. God loves a cheerful giver. Never compromise the truth of God's word. And finally, if you think that we're being overrun at the moment, remember, nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. 
And that quote from 1 Samuel 14, 6, Jonathan and his armor bearer were wandering around and they found a group of about 30 odd Philistines. And the Philistines, uh, Jonathan said to his armor bearer, well, if God's with us, they're going to say, come up. We know we got the victory. And one of them calls out, come on up here, you Jews. We'll show you what's going to happen. So Jonathan and his armor bearer climbed up a slope and slaughtered 30 Philistines because they relied on their covenant with the God of their covenant. By few, two against 30. Gideon's army of 30,000 was cut down to 300 who were fully committed. Remember, they had the torches hidden in a jar and they went in and they broke the jar. They didn't have a sword. They only had these torches and they were shouting out, oh, what was it? Uh, Gideon and the Lord God of Israel or something like that. And the enemy got so confused, they killed each other. God works, doesn't matter whether it's by many or by few. Esther was one person, although she was in a position of great influence. But she was one person and she saved an entire nation by her courage in walking into, basically, her husband's court without being called, which according to the law of the Persians was death unless he extended the golden scepter which he did. That took courage. One person saved the nation. Ability is important, yes. Availability is much more important. Because there's another old saying, God doesn't call. The competent. He makes the called competent. In other words, you don't have to be an expert. If, he, if the Lord puts a call on your life, he will equip you. He's not interested whether you've got the equipment in the first place. He will equip you to do what he wants you to do. You may only be one person. You may be a young person. You might be like some of us where we're, we've got a lot more behind us than what we've got in front of us. He will still equip you to do what he wants you to do. And always remember, you're invincible until God's finished with you. And then you don't have a choice. Amen. That ends the saga of the return to the land. Father, I pray that out of this, well, study, overview of those books about the return of the land, that, Lord, there would be some lessons in there for us to take away, that we too might have a time of recommitment to you, a time of a spiritual awakening, Lord, a time of revival in the church that would flow out to an awakening in the, uh, in the nation, Lord. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.